Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Maya and I work in support services for Prostate Cancer Foundation BC and our support initiative, Prostate Cancer Support Canada. Welcome to our March Coast to Coast meeting. Today we have Dr. John Bell here as a guest speaker. Thank you, Dr. Bell, for giving a presentation today and thank you for all who have joined this meeting. Before we get started, I'll just go over a bit of housekeeping. Mics will be muted during our presentation, but please feel free to send questions via the chat should anything come up during the presentation. A couple of reminders, support group meetings are strictly confidential and any personal information that is shared here today should not be shared outside of this group. The first portion of our meeting will be recorded to share with others who are not able to attend today, but the recording will be shut off following the presentation to encourage free and open discussion, as well as to protect the privacy of all participants. A reminder as well that the facilitators, moderators, and participants today do not provide medical advice. For example, it's okay for a participant to speak about their experiences with a specific treatment, but a participant should not suggest a treatment, medication, or medical procedure to another participant. The opinions and information that are shared at these meetings do not replace the advice of a medical professional. Following the presentation portion of the meeting, there'll be time for a Q&A period. If you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand using the raise your hand function on Zoom which can be found under reactions or participants on the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen, depending on what device you are joining us on today. When you press the raise your hand function, we will see that you have a question and call on you to unmute yourself to ask your question. And without further ado, I'll pass it on to Andrea, who will introduce our speaker, Dr. Bell, today. Thank you, Maya. Uh, Dr. John Bell is the co-leader of OICR Immuno-Oncology Tri-Action the Scientific Director of BioCan RX Network Center of Excellence, a Professor of Medicine at the University of Ottawa, and Senior Scientist at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. Viruses are able to infect cells, replicate, induce cell death, release viral particles, and spread through human tissues, making them an ideal weapon against cancer. Dr. Bell's lab has shown that a variety of viruses selectively replicate in and kill cancer cell lines while leaving healthy parts of the body intact. So with that, I'll pass it on to Dr. Bell to begin this presentation. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Andrea. And hello to everyone today. Uh, I'm uh, I'm going to just get my presentation here one second. I think this is it. There, it's working okay, Andrea, looks all right. Yeah, you're good. Thank Perfect, you. all right. Yep. Um, uh, is, uh, yeah, so I, I'm a, a PhD scientist, so I'm, I'm not uh, gonna be able to give you any good medical advice. I'm, I'm glad to give you lots of medical advice, but it'd be of absolutely no value. I'm a, I'm a PhD scientist. I uh, spend my day working in the lab or working with other scientists and clinicians trying to develop uh, novel therapies for cancer. And I, what I was asked to speak about was the concept of immunotherapy for the treatment of, of cancers, in particular prostate cancer. And, and I'll do that today and give you sort of my view of the field, which has been really rapidly uh, developing over the last uh, 15 years or so. It's been really quite remarkable. Um, this is just a picture of where I work, actually. I, I'm in Ottawa, usually, at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. And this is a picture of the canal, although we didn't get to skate on it this year because it never got uh, thick enough for us to skate on, although the winter seemed pretty cold to me. I don't know why that was, but uh, anyhow, for those of you who are out on the West Coast, uh, this probably is a pretty foreign looking picture to you. Um, so I, I'm going to talk about our immune systems and and how they evolved, how they uh, and uh, how we can then use them to treat cancers. And uh, it's actually... Let me just see if I can get this to work here. Um, you know, the real question is, how do your immune systems work in the first place? Uh, why do you have an immune system? And uh, I mean, I think some of those things seem pretty obvious, but I, I want to walk through some of it anyhow for you, especially since we've all just lived through the pandemic. And, you know, immunotherapy, in terms of at least vaccine, vaccine therapy, has been really at the forefront of everyone's mind. So uh, I think the pandemic's been great from that perspective of sort of getting us to think about immunotherapy and, uh, and how we actually manage to survive on this planet. So this is just uh, something you probably 
experienced during the pandemic where you unfortunately were sitting beside someone who was sneezing on you and you're thinking oh my god what's he doing to me or or like Mr. Bean uh, and we all experienced this and the reason this was particularly relevant during the pandemic of course is that each time that you sneeze you actually spray out uh, an incredible amount of of fluid which you don't normally see and in that fluid if you're infected are a bunch of virus particles and this is really how the pandemic got started and spread so rapidly and, and so we did social distancing and we wore a mask trying to mitigate this but of course in the end the thing that saved us all was is was we took vaccines which helped to prevent the virus from infecting and spreading between people and within ourselves so that's really sort of a, a really great example of how important our immune systems are and they have co-evolved uh, throughout time as we've developed as as humans because aside from the pandemic you are exposed to probably hundreds of viruses every day uh, through people breathing on you or just rubbing against people or, or touching things, as well as bacteria. And you have to have an immune system that's in place to keep those parasites from uh, attacking your body and, and beginning to set up uh, you know, a home inside your body. So, so how does this happen? So let me just speak a little bit about viruses first. These are viruses that are not therapeutic. That's my specialty is working using viruses to attack cancer, but I'm speaking here now just about viruses in general. And viruses are parasites. Uh, they, cannot, they cannot grow unless they're inside of a cell. So if someone did sneeze on your, your coffee table, the virus might sit there, but it wouldn't actually grow at all. It would just sit there until it actually it got picked up by somebody else, and then it could enter into their cells. So we're made up of billions of cells, and, and a virus will enter into that cell. It'll then use its own genetic information to make more virus proteins. And those virus proteins are involved in, uh, in making new virus particles. Uh, but what's important from today's discussion is that some of those virus proteins uh, can become visible to our immune systems. So this normal cell now has, I just put a little uh, thing here to, to, uh, to symbolize a virus protein on its surface. That, that virus protein is now a new, what we call antigen on the surface of this cell. It was not there before, does not normally exist inside your human body. And this virus protein, as I say here, acts as a beacon to your immune system to tell your immune system there's something that shouldn't be here, okay? Because normally your immune system goes around your body looking all the time, making sure that there's nothing foreign there. And if there is, if it sees something like this so-called antigen protein, then it, it awakens the immune system and it begins to try to find ways to attack and destroy that cell. So again, you have virus proteins or antigens on the surface of an infected cell. One way to stop that virus from going anywhere is to kill that infected cell. Because if you kill it, then the viruses can't get out anymore. They've just been, they're just destroyed with that, that dead cell. So that's one arm of the immune system that we use uh, to uh, fight virus spread. And that's carried out by what are called T cells, they're actually thymus cells, but we, we shorten and use the acronym T cells. And these are like little killing machines that roam around your body looking for new antigens that are not supposed to be there. So if a T cell should see this virus antigen on the surface, it'll then be driven towards that antigen, it'll amplify itself, and it'll find ways to destroy this infected cell. At the same time, you also have other part of your immune system, which is required to kill the virus itself. So not the infected cell, but the virus particle. And this is done by what are called B cells. And B cells uh, don't physically attack an infected cell, but what they do is produce other kinds of proteins called antibodies that are highly evolved and can recognize the uh, virus particle and bind to it. And the binding to that virus particle results in destroying it or in activating it so it can't infect again. So most of the time when you receive a COVID vaccine, for instance, what you're really doing is stimulating the B cell response to make antibodies that will attack the virus particle. So, you know, this is how we are set up uh, in, in our, there's actually quite a few uh, other cell types in the immune system, which aren't really relevant to talk about today, but I'll speak about these three kinds of cells that are in our system. There, as I mentioned, is the T cell. Uh, I say here, it's cytotoxic T cell. This is, a, again, a cell 
which is able to recognize an infected cell and through a binding of a receptor, it says, oh, that's a foreign protein there. And then it initiates an immune attack and destroys that cell. And there's also the B cells, like I just mentioned, which can recognize, uh, can produce antibodies. And those antibodies selectively bind to virus particles and destroy them. And this is all coordinated by another cell called an antigen presenting cell or an APC. And it turns out this cell is incredibly important because what it does is it takes up foreign antigens that are produced, for instance, by the virus uh, and digests them and then presents them either to T cells to say, hey, there's something foreign going on here, you should attack the cell that expresses this antigen. Or it may present them to B cells and initiate the B cells response to make a neutralizing antibody. So I, I bring up these three types of cells because it turns out that in fact, in, in an immunotherapy for cancer, these are three critically important cells and in particularly in prostate cancer, uh, the antigen presenting cell is one that's been exploited uh, as a therapeutic uh, type of cell type, which I'll talk about later. So the thing to remember is you have antigen presenting cells, which crawl around your body looking for foreign proteins, foreign antigens that can happen, for instance, from a bacterial or virus infection. They eat them up and then they present them to T cells and say, T cell, go kill a cell that has that antigen on its surface or they present them to B cells and say, B cells make new antibodies that, that recognize the foreign antigen and destroy it. And that's in a nutshell, how we, our, our, our immune system is set up. It's, it's more sophisticated than that, but I think you know, at a high level, that actually explains more, more or less how an immune response gets generated within our body. And your immune system is amazing because it's, it's, it's made in various organs within your body, but these cells circulate around your, your body all the time, looking, doing what's called immune surveillance and looking for new antigens which appear and are a problem for you and, and then try to clear that, those antigens away. So it's actually quite a, a brilliant system that has evolved over the millennia um, through evolution to create a very sophisticated system to fight uh, things that are not supposed to be in your body. So what scientists are trying to do now is saying, okay, we understand the immune system a lot better than we used to. We've done a lot of new technologies that allow us to understand how the immune system works. And what we want to do is now harness that immune system and use it to attack cancer and destroy it. So your immune system evolved largely to fight infections, bacterial and virus infections, but it has the capacity also to recognize cancers. And I'll explain to you in a minute why that is. And so what people like myself are doing is spending a lot of time trying to find ways to harness that immune system and use it to directly attack and eliminate cancers. And this is the whole field of immunotherapy, which has really been you know, accelerated at a tremendous rate over the last uh, 10, 15 years, and is really starting to make a difference in a lot of people's lives because, uh, as I'll show you some examples, even people with some advanced diseases can sometimes benefit from these kinds of so-called immunotherapy. So the way you should think about this, and I, and I saw it as, as the screen came on and I was looking to who's there, I see a lot of you look just like me, uh, old guy with uh, gray hair and thinning hair. And so a lot of you may have seen this movie, which I saw when I was a, um, a young teenage boy called Fantastic Voyage. It's one of these great uh, B movies, science, science fiction B movies that came out at the time. Of course, the, the uh, special effects were much more uh, archaic than they are now but the context of this movie which was quite was quite neat so I was I think I was like 13 at the time when this movie came out and what happened is that the premise of the movie if, if you don't remember it uh, was that uh, some very important person uh, who was critical to the future of the planet uh, had developed a, a, a an aneurysm in his brain or a brain tumor or something I can't remember exactly what he had but he had some inoperable problem in his head and so they had to find some way to treat him. And so what they did is they uh, got a submarine and a bunch of uh, scientists, they put them in a submarine and they shrank it down so it was small and they could then inject it into the body. And then that submarine went around through the blood vessels and they were looking to try to find the, the uh, offending disease and then find ways to destroy it. So partly that was, um, let me just get rid of this. Uh, partly, you know, this whole concept was sort of 
for me as a 13 year old boy, it was quite interesting, but also Raquel Welch was in this and she was, you know, a beautiful woman at the time. And that as a 13 year old boy full of testosterone that also managed to blaze us into my mind. But it made me think about, wouldn't it be cool if we could have little therapies that we gave to people through their blood and they would go around and look for uh, diseases and fix them up. And in fact, that's what immunotherapy really is. Instead of having little submarines, we have these immune cells which can travel around your body and look for disease states and find ways to destroy them and then, and in fact, uh, find ways to uh, repair the damage that happens there. And I'm not going to speak much about it today, but we also develop viruses that are therapeutic and spread throughout the blood system, again, looking for tumors selectively to destroy them. So that's sort of how uh, I often think about how immunotherapy is working. So if you ever saw that movie and, and you cringed at how bad it was, you might also be able to use that as a, a tool to think about how immunotherapy works. So how can our immune systems actually even detect cancers? Because as you all know, cancer is not a foreign antigen. It's not a foreign virus. It's actually a disease of our own genetic information. So how is it that we're able to uh, develop an immune response against a cancer? So if we go back and think, so then it's going to give you a little bit of uh, uh, my viewpoint of how we're all put together. I'm a molecular biologist, which means I study uh, biology at the molecular level and try to understand how well, we all were born and created and how, uh, and how that impacts diseases. So at one point, uh, all of us on this call looked like this, which is actually a, a fertilized human egg. And so uh, we all started out looking like this. And what's really amazing, what I found really captivating about this whole concept was that, as you probably realize, that all the genetic information required to make another human being is contained within that single cell, that single egg, which is phenomenal. And then over a matter of hours after fertilization, uh, you now have a multicellular embryo that's formed, which contains all the genetic information in each of these cells to make another human being. And, and that's amazing. And I, you know, it's, uh, I found that to be uh, incredible, but that what's even more amazing to me and, and my wife and I have had four kids is that after a matter of weeks, you now look like this. So you've gone from a single cell to someone who looks like this in weeks to months. And this person has, is full of, of billions of cells. And so each of the cells in this person's body has all the information to make another human being, which is still my, you know, I, I understand how this first part happened very well, but then how did it get to this stage? It's just incredible to me that this is happening and all the genetic information is coded in our genes to make this happen in a matter of weeks to months. Phenomenal. Over time, over decades, time goes by. And of course, things don't always work out the way we want because, you, you know, we often uh, end up not looking like we think we're going to look. But e even Homer here, he's, he, you know, his his skin tone, which is so complimentary here, is probably encoded in his genes, although his girth is probably related to his environment and eating habits. So a combination of your genetics and how you, you live and so on is what really what creates you in, in the end. So why am I saying all this? Well, it's because we now know that cancer is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, and as you probably all know, a disease of our own genetic information. And so as a result, really the secret to how cancers arise is understanding how this process happens in the first place and decoding what all these gene products do. So here's just a very simple cartoon uh, of, uh, to try to explain this concept a little bit more. So let's pretend this is your skin and this is an individual skin cell. There's a nucleus where all your DNA is contained. And as I said, each cell here has all the information to make another human being. And uh, as you know, our skin turns over every day and, and our blood turns over every day. You make it like uh, several billion new blood cells every day and probably the same number of skin cells. And what happens is this is all genetically coordinated so that uh, a cell in your skin will undergo cell division in response to expression of gene products in your nucleus. And you'll have two cells. Uh, but if, this, if that just kept happening and there was no control over that process, you know, your skin would just continue to grow, you know, be 20 feet drag it on behind you. So instead, what happens is there's actually not only genes that say it's time to grow, but there's cell death genes that say it's time for a particular cell to die. And so at the end of the day, 
because this coordination between cell growth genes and cell death genes, we have the same number of cells we started with, even though we rejuvenate and have new cells every single day. So that happens in this, you know, over our lifetimes, billions and billions and billions of time. It's actually an amazing orchestration of, of, of our gene program. But what happens in a, in a cancer? So for any number of reasons, uh, and it can be because of our lifestyle, maybe we smoked, maybe we go to tanning parlors when we shouldn't, we live in big cities, but also something I would call just plain old bad luck. Because if you think about it, if you're replicating your genetic information every day for your whole life, billions of times, the chances you do that replication perfectly without making a mistake are probably pretty low. So just by bad luck, you might get a mutation that occurs. And if it happens by chance that you have a mutation in your cell death genes, well, this cell now is different than all its sister cells, okay? It genetically is identical in many respects. In fact, essentially almost completely identical, but it has a, a mutation in say, its cell death genes, then that cell will continue to divide because it still has its cell growth genes and divide and divide, but it won't know, remember how to die, okay? It'll be immortalized and it ends up forming a tumor. And so over the last 30, 40 years, we've understood this. Now we understand exactly uh, how cancers can arise by a, a, an accumulation of different kinds of mutations within a particular cell within your body. Uh, and, and that's been really important because it's taught us a lot about not only how ca cancers arise, but how cancers can be recognized by your immune system. So this, even though this cell and the cell beside it are, are genetically very, very similar, they're also different enough because this cell now makes slightly different proteins through these mutations that as this red cell now can become visible to your uh, immune system. So in a way, a cancer cell makes a deal with the devil. It becomes immortal by mutating these genes and the gene products they make, the proteins they make, but it turns them visible to the immune system. So I've just shown it here as being red versus blue. So our immune systems can now go around and hypothetically recognize these, these cells. Because just like a virus infection, which has new virus proteins in the surface, a cancer cell has new cancer-specific proteins on its surface, and therefore it can become visible to your immune system in principle. And when it is, then these so-called T cells, which we talked about earlier on, have the capacity to recognize that cancer cell as foreign, and they glom onto the side of it. And it's actually quite brilliant what they do. They actually inject proteins inside this cancer cell to kill it. And these proteins are special proteins which tell the, the, the injected cell that it's, it should now commit suicide itself and kills itself. So this is an actual photo, uh, movie, as you can see, of a T cell actively attacking and then destroying a cancer cell. So we said T cells are serial killers because this T cell can recognize a cancer cell and kill it, and then it can move on to another cancer cell and kill it. So it can kill up to 16 different cells a day and if you have billions of T cells, then you have 16 billion cancer cells that they can kill every day. So in a perfect world, this is what would happen and cancers would get eliminated. And so this is another cartoon to show you that you can see this is actually for a different kind of T cell killing uh, that we use for leukemia. But you can see the T cells recognize that cancer cell is foreign, glom onto it, inject it with these uh, T cell like poisons, and that causes the cancer cell to then disappear. However, this is a great story and, you know, the immune system when it works and it probably works all the time. And the reality is we probably have mutations in our body all the time during our lifetimes and, and the, those, get, those cells get eliminated by our immune systems. But unfortunately, sometimes uh, these cancers find a way to escape the immunotherapy that we constantly have ongoing in our bodies. And those, when they do that, they're able to hide and be stealth and avoid immunotherapy. So there's really a number of different challenges to immunotherapy, which I'll talk about here, which make it sometimes hard to treat certain patients. So uh, T cells, again, are important. As I said, we have them to fight virus infections. We have them to fight bacterial infections. We have them to fight cancer cells. But because T cells are very active and can kill uh, cells that they bind to, they have to also be tightly controlled. So you have to have ways to say to your T cells, you know, come on, calm down. Don't attack that normal kidney because we don't want to destroy the kidney. Don't attack the stomach. We don't want to destroy the stomach because it's an important organ. 
And so we have in our bodies ways to tell T cells to calm down and not to attack particular organs. And that's a, what a defense mechanism we have built into ourselves. So it keeps the T cell from attacking normal tissues. And this is done through a variety of different kinds of proteins on the surface. Well, cancer cells, unfortunately, have figured this out. And so they sometimes express another protein which binds to the, this, this regulatory protein on the surface of the T cell, and they inactivate the T cell. So they basically push a button and say, T cell, don't kill me. I'm actually a normal cell. And the T cell can't figure out that, in fact, it's a cancer cell because this protein is expressed by the tumor cell at high levels. So it's a, a devious way for the, immune, for the tumor cell to sort of silence the immune system and shut it down so it can't attack the cancer. So what people have developed now are proteins, uh, as I mentioned, the B cell type proteins or antibodies, which can bind to these uh, things that are, that are expressed by cancer cells that are designed to shut down T cell activity. And when, you, when you, those antibodies bind to these uh, negative signals, the T cell becomes active again and can destroy the cancer. So one new form of, of therapy that's really taken hold in the uh, cancer space is developing certain kinds of antibodies, which can be used as, as, uh, um, as tools to inhibit the inhibitory activity, of, as it were, of a tumor cell. So when a tumor cell tries to shut down a T cell, we can use an antibody to prevent that from happening. And the T cell can then re-recognize the tumor cell and destroy it. So this was a really a breakthrough. It's called immune checkpoint uh, inhibition therapy. And it's named this because uh, there are so-called immune checkpoints or proteins which tell the immune system to quiet down. And cancer cells, as I said, inappropriately express these proteins and therefore shut down the immune system and keep it from attacking the tumor when we want to. So we can intervene by using these so-called antibodies, and this was called anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-L1, which allow the T cell then to be able to have the brakes taken off and attack the cancer. So that's one issue that we've learned over the years that cancers have evolved these tricks to make themselves appear stealth to the immune system. And we can now overcome that uh, by using certain kinds of antibodies. Another problem is that not in the case of prostate, but it's true of all cancers, is that not all cancers are the same. So you, the pathway from a, a normal cell to a cancer cell can be different for different people. And so, for example, some uh, people suffering from prostate cancer, inside their cancers, they have many, many mutations uh, that have happened during the, the evolution of that tumor. And because they have many mutations, they actually have lots of targets for the immune system. So that's why they're bright red. So they're easier for the immune system to recognize. Uh, but many prostate cancers have a small number of mutations, and it's just because of the way that that cancer evolved in the first place. So you can see they're not really as bright red, and so it's harder for the immune system to detect these. So that heterogeneity that we see between people with different kinds of cancers is another challenge that we face in trying to find ways to develop therapies to detect cancers because not all cancers are the same. And in fact, even more diabolical is that in some in some person, you may see heterogeneity between the primary and a metastatic lesion in some way, so that there's ways that the immune system might be able to attack the primary, but not the metastatic lesion. These are all challenges that we have to continually uh, work to, to overcome, but a lot of progress has been made uh, in that direction. The, the final thing I'll say about a challenge to the uh, ability to develop an immunotherapy is that a tumor is really a, a complex very immune suppressive, I'd call, I'm just calling it an organ. It's not really an organ, of course. It's actually a, uh, it's a mess of, of uh, cancer and normal cells that are all integrated together. So this picture is to, to, reckon, to, to sort of represent that. So these are cancer cells, but you can see there's also blood vessels coming in that have to feed the cancer cells. And there's immune cells coming in to try to, uh, you know, play a role in attacking the cancer or not attacking the cancer. And so what you create here is what's called a tumor microenvironment, where there's a tumor and lots of adjacent cells around it. And what cancer cells do is they secrete factors shown here by some of these green dots or red dots that go and impact the surrounding cells around them to make what's called a hostile tumor microenvironment or a cold tumor microenvironment so that immune cells can't even penetrate into it 
or if they come in, they get shut down, they get silenced by the, by the cancer. So this is another challenge that we face in trying to find ways to get immunotherapies that will attack the cancer. So in the best case scenario, if you had a cancer that had a, a very simple tumor microenvironment, it had a lot of mutations that were easy to see by the immune system, then perhaps you can have an immunotherapy that works very, very effectively. But in other patients, if it's very complex because of this heterogeneity and within the patient or the, the, the convoluted way the cancer is formed, then immunotherapy is a little more challenging to develop. Not impossible, mind you, and certainly we're seeing lots of cases where we're developing strategies to overcome these challenges. So uh, let me just speak to you a little bit about what are the approved immunotherapies for prostate cancer? Now, the unfortunate news is that there hasn't been a lot of really good immunotherapies approved yet for prostate cancer because of the biology of this particular tumor. Uh, immunotherapies worked extremely well for some cancers, like uh, some forms of lung cancer and some forms of melanoma or skin cancer. Uh, <clears throat> but it hasn't worked so well for most forms of prostate cancer yet. Um, but that doesn't mean it can't work. It means that we just have to figure out better how to, how to make it work. So remember, as I said, there was these so-called angiopresenting cells and T cells and B cells all involved in the ability to generate immunotherapeutic products. Uh, the first ever immunotherapy developed and approved was actually a product that maybe many of you have heard about called Pro, uh, developed by a company called Provenge, or Dendrion, which made a product called Provenge, pardon me, and this is actually a vaccine approach. And what the uh, scientists and clinicians did is they, they created a vaccine that they could feed to dendritic cells. And this vaccine was against a protein that was found at a high level on many prostate cancers. And so this is used to educate engine presenting cells. They get all excited because they ate this protein, and then they present it to T cells and B cells and try to generate an immune response. And like I said, this is really the first immune uh, uh, approved uh, immunotherapy product in the world, which is sort of interesting for cancer, which is sort of interesting because it was really, uh, prostate cancer is, as I said, been a real challenge, and yet the first one ever developed was actually for prostate cancer. So this is approved in the United States. I don't know whether or not this is approved in Canada. I, I don't think it is, but I don't know that for sure. There's a second kind of therapy that's uh, been approved for uh, prostate cancer patients, only about a specific, a specific type of prostate cancer patient. And this is, uh, again, this immune checkpoint inhibitor uh, antibody I was talking about. And this is an antibody which, which reawakens T cells and tells them, go ahead and do what you're going to do, attack that prostate cancer. And it works uh, only in a small proportion of patients who have a, an unusual uh, phenotype where their tumor has a lots, hundreds, uh, if not thousands of mutations as a result of the way that that prostate cancer formed in the first place. And uh, it is only a small percentage of patients who have this particular kind of prostate cancer. And so for those kinds of uh, patients, this is very effective. And so they can uh, receive uh, immune checkpoint therapy and, and often have a good outcome. But for most prostate cancer patients, these inhibitors so far have not been as good as we'd like to see them be. And we're working on ways to make them better. So strategies are sort of under development right now uh, for prostate cancer include, uh, of course, this Provenge thing I told you about already where you, you get this uh, prostate-specific uh, phosphatase antigen fed to the dendritic cells, which then activates uh, T cells and B cells, and that is approved in the United States at least. Uh, we uh, are working on developing other kinds of T cell products where we engineer the T cell to be able to recognize uh, the prostate cancer as a foreign entity. These are so-called chimeric antigen receptor T cells or CAR T cells. And in this case, you, you purposely put an antigen on the surface of the, of the T cell so it can now recognize prostate cancer cells based upon antigens which prostate uh, tissues normally express. And that's under development. Uh, Still work to be done on that. There's no approved CAR T cell product for prostate or for any other solid tumor yet. It's worked really well in leukemia, but not so well in, in solid tumors yet, but people are coming up with clever strategies to make that work. There are other things called bispecific antibodies, uh, which again, the concept of using antibodies produced by B cells to link a T cell to a cancer cell 
and cause it to destroy it. And these are so-called T-cell engagers. And again, these are in advanced trials in patients right now. We're waiting to see what the outcomes are. But there's hope that, in fact, this strategy might uh, find a way to drive your T-cells into your tumor and, and make them more effective. There's also other kinds of uh, antibodies that have been developed to try to overcome the immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment. Again, these are in late-stage clinical trials. Um, and there's a drug which many of you may have heard about, which is approved recently, which is uh, actually not an antibody or immunotherapy per se, but what it is, is a, it's a, a radionucleotide or a, a radioactive piece of material, which is linked to a, a peptide, which allows it to bind to a, a surface antigen on prostate, uh, prostate cancer cells. And it's used for imaging, but also as a therapeutic in some patients. So these are sorts of things that are ongoing. And, uh, and you know, if you ask me what's going to work, I'll tell you that it's probably going to be a combination of, of these approaches. We're going to find that we have to combine uh, maybe antibodies to overcome immunosuppression. At the same time, we provide T cells that can attack the cancer in some way to, to, uh, to increase its activity. And this is happening in real time right now. If you go and look at clinicaltrials.gov, which I'm sure many of you have done, you can find different trials testing these as single agents. And I think the real... Uh, happiness and, and success is going to happen when we start to combine them together. Uh, there's other kinds of uh, things that are under development right now for uh, cancer therapy. One that uh, I'm really excited about is called TIL therapy or tumor infiltrating lymphocyte therapy. It has been used in prostate cancer a little bit, not too successfully yet, but again, I think it's early days. It's actually a really clever uh, um, procedure. Uh, where a tumor is excised from the patient, and inside that tumor there are immune cells that have gone in there to attack the cancer, but then put to been put to sleep by the by the tumor itself. So we take that bit out, we expand the T cells away from the cancer, we grow them up to really high numbers, and we infuse them back into the patient. And this kind of therapy has been under development for thirty years or more, and in uh, in, in melanoma patients, it's been very effective in some melanoma patients. Um, some people, people even with very advanced disease, uh, end up being cured by it. Um, but it's it's really not been uh, too successful as yet in other kinds of solid tumors, but lots of hope that this will work. And we've developed some of this technology uh, now with a colleague of mine, uh, Simone Turcott, who's in Montreal, uh, and we have a, a grant from the Canadian Cancer Society uh, to begin to develop this technology in Canada because we think we have some clever ideas on how to make this even better. And uh, so we're quite excited to begin to try to get that started uh, sometime later this year, early next year, to really get a new approach for trying to uh, soup up, as it were, the immune system in pa patients and, and put it back into them to get them to uh, attack the cancer. There's also cancer-selective viruses, uh, which Andrea mentioned at the beginning, it's something I've been working on for many, many years, and those, are, I think, are also very exciting. I think they're going to be interesting to be used in combinations with things like TIL therapy. Uh, there are people developing therapeutic bacteria. These are bacteria which, again, like the virus, you know, you sort of think of a, a virus as a, as a bad thing, like in a pandemic, but you can control them and harness them to make them um, infect only cancers. Similarly, for therapeutic bacteria, although bacterial infections sound bad, you can engineer bacteria to go and home inside a tumor and express proteins there that can be therapeutic. Or you can even do things like people are looking at changing uh, the, the microbiota, as we call it, or the, the types of bacteria that are in your colon, because we now know that those can impact how well your immune response uh, reacts against the tumor in ways which are still somewhat mysterious, but there's actually people doing things like fecal transplants to try to improve people's uh, ability to respond to immunotherapy. And there's lots of new antibodies being developed at all times to find new ways to creatively activate the immune system. So, you know, not there yet, but I would say that the, the you know, what has happened over the last, um, you know, 10, 15 years has been remarkable. And, the, and we're just on this upslope right now of using new combinations and, and finding new discoveries all the time. So I think there's reason to be optimistic that new approaches will be developed uh, that will be effective in all kinds of cancers, including prostate cancer. So just to give you a, one last little image in your mind of, of how well 
immunotherapy can work. Now, this is a completely different uh, a disease. This is melanoma that this gentleman has. As you can see on his scalp, he's got a lot of lesions on his scalp. He's actually already failed immunotherapy and everything else. Uh, and then he was allowed to go on a trial, uh, which used uh, one of these viruses uh, that Andrea mentioned that are being developed. This is a virus called Cavitac. Uh, and it was used to inject into some of these tumors and then add on another one of those immune checkpoint antibodies. And what you can see is that uh, he started off with large, rapidly growing tumors on his scalp. If anything, it looks a little bit worse a month later. Uh, but in fact, that's because as the immune system begins to attack the cancer, it swells up like when you sprain your ankle. And, and if you wait and are patient, then over time, you can see they actually start to all resolve. And in the end, this gentleman had a complete response. So you can see that, you know, even in cancers, which are really advanced and are really, uh, you know, seem like they're rapidly going under control, if we get things right, we can get the immune system to go in there and attack the cancer and people can have great responses. So that's, you know, I've been doing this job for a long time. And I have to say that what I've seen in immunotherapy has completely changed my viewpoint of how we can treat with ca treat cancers. And, and I feel very optimistic that this is going to change outcomes for a lot of patients uh, in the near future and not too distant future. So I'm just going to end there and say that, uh, you know, I know all of you are involved in supporting cancer research at some level. And when you do that, you're actually supporting these kinds of people. These are many of my colleagues from across the country who I work with or people who work in my own lab. Uh, and we get together every year and have a retreat where we, you know, sit by the fire, drink a little beer and talk some science. And, and this is often where we actually come up with some really interesting new ideas. So these are the bright young people who are MDs, PhDs, who you support through your, the, the, the research that you support through whatever foundations you do it through the Canadian Cancer Society or, or the Terry Fox or whatever you do or through your taxes. So on behalf of them, I just want to say thank you to all of you for the support you give to the cancer research field, because uh, we wouldn't be able to do what we do without uh, the support we get from all of you.